We're just waiting. Or send the content to the group. We'll yeah. I can perhaps, uh, you know, set the context. I think Aditya is still um, waiting to enter the conference. Sure, let's go ahead, Aparna. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you everyone for uh, joining today. Quite looking forward to the discussion on, uh, you know, how Dib Ready is your nonprofit. So just to give you a little bit of a background, we started, uh, you know, kicked off the blended finance series yesterday with a masterclass as well as an investor roundtable, which, uh, you know, received a lot of good traction, great questions, and uh, happy to be continuing on that same momentum with today's session um, on how Dave Ready is your nonprofit. Um, just a quick explanation on what an impact bond is for those of you uh, who are not familiar with the concept is essentially um, you know, a tri-party contract between a service provider uh, and investor who provides the upfront capital. So the service provider actually works with the beneficiaries on the ground. It could be an intervention in, in any sector, healthcare, education, water, sanitation, etc. Um, the risk investor is the one that provides upfront uh, capital to the service provider and helps them achieve certain set social or environmental outcomes. And if those outcomes are met, uh, you know, at the end of the stipulated time period, then we have uh, the outcome funder actually pay the risk investor back and can also, you know, provide an incentive for the service provider. Um, the three parties are, are, you know, often assisted with a performance manager or a program manager that works very closely with the service provider, helps them put into place certain data systems uh, that, you know, make sure that they can uh, achieve the targets that have been set out. And we also have an independent evaluator who's responsible for actually, uh, you know, conducting the evaluation. Um, these can be at the end of the two or three years for which the impact bond has been set out, or even, um, you know, at intermediate level so that the, the data that's been collected through the evaluation actually forms part of the feedback loop. Uh, so it's really, uh, you know, meant to be the four or five different actors coming together to achieve certain social outcomes and they're all mission aligned to, and working towards this. So, um, so with that uh, background, I'd like to provide a little bit of context for today's session as well. Um, so, you know, we've often heard from investors that they do want to provide capital and, um, you know, but just not finding the right number of organizations at the right scale uh, who can actually absorb this capital. Um, and the other side of the coin is social enterprises or nonprofits saying that, you know, they're ready, uh, but they're not too familiar with what an impact bond really is. What does it entail? So really, we thought we'd use this session today. We have, uh, uh, you know, experts like Kate, Tushar, um, Aditya, who leads Kevalya, as well as Akshay Soni, talking about data systems, about capacity building. Um, and what nonprofits can really do and should do to be ready, not just for impact bonds, but in, in general, uh, you know, as data becomes more, more key to driving any intervention. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Kate, uh, maybe I'll start with you first. And you know, as Sriram said, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're dialing in from San Francisco and it's fairly late there. Um, so Kate Sterla is a director in the innovation team at ID Insight and leads their results-based financing work. Uh, previously, uh, she was based out of India for the last three years and also led the evaluation of the first impact bond in India, which was the Educate Girls Dib uh, out of Rajasthan. Um, and Kate, thanks again for joining in. Um, pleasure to have you here with us today. Tushar uh, is a specialist in investing for development space. He's part of the Dalbert team in the Bombay office, and his work focuses on impact investing, innovative and blended finance, as well as financial inclusion. Um, he's been involved in a variety of projects, including, including advising philanthropic foundations, donors uh, on blended finance strategies, and private sector enterprises on funding their inclusive uh, business ventures. Uh, he has extensive background in investment banking, specifically in M&A and fundraising transactions. Uh, welcome, Tushar. Glad you're here with us today. Um, I'm not sure if Aditya has uh, joined us as yet, but um, I'll still go ahead and introduce him. So Aditya is the founder and director of Kevalya Education Foundation. 
um, which is you know a leading nonprofit that supports large scale systemic changes in public education systems. Uh, he's currently working with over 15,000 education leaders across 14, um, you know, working with 5 million students across 50,000 states. Um, Aditya has worked in the past with Pratham, um, you know, he's also been a consultant with KPMG, he's an Ashoka Fellow, uh, an Echoing Green Fellow, as well as an Aspen India Fellow. So welcome, Aditya. And um, last but not the least, we have Akshay with us, who is, uh, you know, from the Nudge Foundation himself. And uh, Akshay brings with him over two decades of experience in capital markets, uh, focused on equity analysis across various sectors. Um, Akshay, uh, thanks for being with us today. And I know when we spoke, you said you bring the same rigor and the thought process that you had in the capital markets to actually working with teams, so he, he actually um, helped set up and shape the capacity building accelerator at the Nudge Foundation. So thank you all for um, joining us. Tushar, maybe we'll have um, you kickstart the conversation today, really to you know, break it down very, very simply um, as to what really performance management is, what does it entail, why is it relevant? Thanks. Thanks, Atana. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, very, very pleased to be here. Um, uh, just a very quick uh, background to Dalberg. Uh, as as uh, a lot of you might know, uh, we are a strategy consulting firm which focuses on developmental issues. Uh, and uh, as, as um, Apana mentioned, I, I work as a specialist in the investing space there. Um, moving on to uh, impact bonds, I think uh, um, we, uh, as, as, as you're aware, right, we, we've been uh, part of the performance management team uh, for uh, for the Quality Education India uh, Dib, uh, which has been going on for a couple of years now, um, I think uh, uh, starting out at 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 a, at a very fundamental level, uh, performance management is seen as uh, something which essentially helps bring uh, the various stakeholders who who at least have, you know before the dip process starts off have been working in, in very different ways to help achieve uh, the targeted outcomes uh, that, that are being set out uh, by the impact bond. And I think uh, the targeted outcomes Im impact different stakeholders in different ways. Um, the, the outcome funder, as you mentioned, is, is interested in seeing or maximizing um, the, the outcomes themselves. Um, the, uh, the risk investor uh, is, is interested in ensuring that the targets are met so that uh, their, their money gets paid out. And, and, we've, and I think uh, a lot of risk investors that we've seen so far are also focused on impact and therefore they uh, play a dual role as well. Um, for service providers, I think uh, it, is, it, is, it is really important that they're able to understand how to work within a fairly, uh, often a fairly different framework. A number of uh, service providers uh, do have uh, an understanding of the space uh, and then have uh, team members on board who understand how to uh, how to work within a sort of almost a markets oriented framework um, but uh, but for for a number of uh, other service providers i think it's it's important for them uh, to be able to understand how um, they need to uh, maybe think differently change the uh, dna to to the extent uh, you know it doesn't start impacting uh, the, the actual on the ground uh, impact that they have uh, to to be able to uh, work within this framework and achieve uh, the the outcomes uh, that they, that they need to and i think uh, uh, and also, uh, you know, at, at an overall level, bringing all of these different people together, uh, having someone who speaks uh, the different languages or, or understands the different contexts that service providers, investors, outcome funders come from, I think becomes fairly critical. Uh, and, and this is where uh, the performance manager comes in uh, and, and being able to, and, and of course, that, you know, there are other stakeholders as well, like impact evaluators, et cetera, uh, who, uh, who also have um, a, a really important role to play. Uh, and and the, and the performance manager really comes in and and works with uh, all these different uh, stakeholders uh, and, to, and, and helps essentially bring about an alignment uh, of, um, um, of 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 what these different stakeholders are trying to achieve, uh, while um, helping you know there, there's some uh, very uh, specific uh, uh, parts of the role uh, which 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 have to do with reporting and, and which are just slightly more op operational, uh, which I think are important as well. But I think what is more important is, is, is trying to figure out what are, uh, at least initially trying to figure out what um, are the requirements uh, of, of, of the different stakeholders to move towards a place where um, uh, they are able to uh, actually achieve uh, the outcomes that they've set out to. So for example, if, if there's a need uh, for, for, for a service provider 
to to build for example you mentioned data uh, to to develop data systems what are those systems which need to be put into place what what does that mean for the organization what are the implications and then understanding the the context of the service providers and being able to communicate with the investors and um and the outcome funders to say that look this is what uh, what can work what cannot so so uh, you know uh, it, it it can be a fairly dynamic role uh, requiring a fair bit of uh, understanding from uh, of the context from all sides especially when there's a portfolio approach being taken like it is in the quality education india uh, day uh, where there are multiple different service providers who would have multiple different needs uh, but but are trying to achieve uh, similar outcomes that's i, I would say uh, you know in 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 a in a snapshot uh, what uh, performance managers end up doing uh, but happy to sort of discuss more as we go along sure and and tushar if we can just um you know stay with you so um who typically uh, you know is paying for this because in a traditional grant based model we you know we don't see performance managers so that is something that you know we've seen come in with some of these pay for success instruments given the high stakes involved so who's typically uh, you know helping support this and what have been some of the challenges that you faced have organizations been um, you know open to the feedback or, or does that require a process of kind of building that relationship with them as you go on sure uh, so i think for for the for the first question which is around who incurs the cost i think here because the risk is being taken Uh, by the risk investor uh, for the delivery of outcomes it is typically the risk investor who has an interest in uh, in, in having someone performance manager and therefore um, uh, more often than not it would be the risk investor who would uh, end up uh, also also incurring the cost um in uh, you know in in, in terms of uh, challenges i think it is uh, it it's 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 quite uh, interesting how the role has evolved uh, for us and i think uh, if 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 you know again going back to the very fundamentals of talking about helping um, achieve uh, if 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 the original role definition for example is just to say that we are there to help achieve the outcome targets uh, which have been put into place um and and if, if that is where the incentives lie then uh, you know if, if you look at the quality education india uh, that 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 we are uh, that we are working on uh, that kevali is also part of um uh, the uh, the service providers there have been far exceeding uh, their targets and and uh, you know uh, at at that point of time then um the the role of the performance manager needs to also evolve uh, to take into account one uh, you know uh, the, the objectives as i mentioned before uh, also involve impact maximization and can can we can can we still continue to work with uh, the service providers uh, to help them uh, arrive at uh, uh, arrive at uh, you know a, a bit, a better impact metrics better outcomes etc uh, and and help them identify areas in which uh, they could potentially do that uh, so so just the uh, you know being flexible about the role and being able to think through on where uh, the performance management role is is additive i think it is really important and i think we've learned that uh, over a period of time um as as we go along i think uh, the the point that you mentioned about the relationship building is fairly crucial um what uh, you know uh, again uh, something which uh, it is the perception i've seen when i when i speak with different people about performance management is that it 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 is focused on a lot of hard skills uh, so so there is you know focus on data reporting figuring out how much who needs to pay whom um but uh, we are uh, 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 we we quickly realized i think in the initial part that it is, it is it is as important to to focus on uh, some of the softer areas uh, which which might have to do with um uh, dna systems uh, philosophies etc and and to figure out what is what is a good balancing act uh, that that service providers can potentially get to um and and that does require a fair bit of um sort of initial work uh, which goes towards understanding each other uh, speaking Uh, the same language uh, trust building with each other uh, ensuring that that we know uh, you know uh, ensuring that we we are trying to um, work additively or 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 we are trying to um, work work towards uh, similar objectives rather than having divergences etc so i think spending time uh, initially uh, b- building that trust uh, working with service providers and with investors and with outcome funders to ensure that um uh you know we, uh, we we are able to actually have make an impact on some of these softer issues i think is really really crucial because i think our our role uh, is to uh, is to is to help uh, various stakeholders uh, get to uh, get to these objectives i think uh, I, i i think everyone wants to sort of drive that impact uh, and then therefore i don't think there's pushback once there's an understanding of 
of, of where everyone's coming from uh, and, and what their contexts are and therefore what are the constraints that they are under. Uh, and, and we found that you know over a period of time, um, we've, we've been able to actually uh, develop a fairly strong uh, working relationship uh, with, with most of the service providers. Sure. Thanks for sharing that. And um, Kate, if I may, uh, you know, loop you into the conversation now, um, you know, evaluation is something uh, extremely critical, uh, you know, as we talked about at the start of the, of the talk, uh, given the high stakes involved, right? So, um, what's what's your thinking you know how do you kind of strike the the right balance between too much evaluation too little evaluation because again there seems to be this constant tug of war between those asking for the data and those who need to supply it so the service providers and, and the investors or the donors um, so how do you kind of um, you know settle that what's the right level of, of evaluation that's practical robust yeah, that's such a great question. And I think I would answer it a little bit differently depending on the type of project. So um, ID Insight, actually relatively few of our projects are impact bonds. Um, that's like a really exciting area that we're increasingly working in, but a lot of our work is still working very collaboratively um, you know, with organizations to help them inform decisions um, using data. And so what we always say is that the rigor of the tool really needs to be commensurate to the importance of the question. That you know, sometimes there's this kind of sense that there's this pressure to just rush to an impact evaluation. And, and I think often, it, you know, given the stage of development of an organization, it makes a lot more sense to really you know, um, gather really good implementation data and really understand the theory of change and kind of lay that foundation before you know, doing something kind of so high stakes and such a big investment. Um, so we're pretty comfortable with the idea that you know, not everything has to be a randomized controlled trial. And I will say that in the context of impact bonds, um, I think that's a really good example of a high stakes decision that often does need to be backed up with a lot of rigor because um, there is, of course, the, the money writing on the outcomes of that Im impact evaluation. Um, but also, I think there's a pretty big reputational risk that the impact bonds that have been conducted so far, one of the reasons I'm so impressed um, with the nonprofits that choose to participate in them is that they're really putting themselves on the line that not only are they going to be evaluated, but that those results are going to be announced to the world and you know, this framing of targets, that they did or did not hit targets, which you know, is a, a, a tough thing to make yourself, you know, um, uh, to open yourself up to. Um, so I think the way we often think about it, and I think the Educate Girls Development Impact Bond provides some good examples of this, is, is being really thoughtful about the context and the type of data that you're going to need to, to make those decisions and make sure that everybody really understands the risks involved. So in the case of the Educate Girls Development Impact Bond, we were actually looking at two outcomes. Um, one was changes in uh, learning levels, and then the other was enrollments. And we actually made this decision after consulting with all the other partners on that project to take different approaches to evaluating each. So in the case of learning levels, those are really tricky to measure well. Um, you need really precise measurements. And I think importantly, we knew that all the kids were going to be learning over the course of three years. The question wasn't, you know, are they improving? but how much more are they improving as the result of this program? So we decided that in that case, we needed to be you know, really precise and have a really good counterfactual. And so um, we collected our own learning data and we also collected learning data from a set of control schools so that we would really um, be able to estimate with precision um, what Educate Girls you know, value add was. Um, but in the case of enrollment, uh, one, it would have been pretty cost prohibitive to go out and, and kind of collect data on girls who were out of school and then were not going to be enrolled as part of this program. I think there were ethical issues to spending a lot of time identifying that population and then not helping them. Um, and also, I think there was a pretty good case to be made that um, just given everybody's contextual knowledge of where this program was operating, that after a certain point, it was pretty unlikely that a girl who was out of school was going to re-enroll of her own accord. And so kind of given those set of assumptions, we all felt kind of comfortable enough to decide to just do a pre-post um, approach there, where we looked at how many girls were out of school in treatment villages at the beginning, and then what percentage of them enrolled over time. Um, but one important thing that I always try to emphasize there is that there are risks involved to that approach, and that I think Educate Girls was pretty thoughtful about kind of assuming that risk. So um, one thing that we thought about a lot as we were taking that approach is that if there was some kind of external shock in those three years, you know, if there was a drought and lots of kids were dropping out of school, there wouldn't really have been a way for us to account for um, that in our estimates of Educate Girls' impact, that they would have kind of um, assumed the blame for something that was beyond their control. And so I think that is the risk of not having a counterfactual. And I think in general, 
for any DIB or any evaluation, making sure that those risks are really clear and communicated to all the parties um, is a, a really important first step. Sure. I think that makes sense. And I think uh, for any sort of interaction or oh, sorry, intervention that's happening right now, right, with, with the current COVID situation where students are not able to come to school, how do you really deal with that? So um, I'm sure you, you know, have thought about that when you were even structuring the Educate Girls Dip, not maybe from the pandemic lens, but from a drought or, you know, other sort of um, causes that you really are beyond our control. So how do you, um, you know, work with different stakeholders to get them onto the same um, consensus that if something like this were to come up, how do you really go about deal with it? Who faces the brunt for that, right? So uh, can you give us a little bit more context on that front? Yeah, no, that's a great um, question. I mean, I, I don't think there's hard and fast answers. And I think this a lot of this gets back to what Tushar was saying about building that trust, making sure there's a common language at the outset, you know, that that's important in any project. And I think, you know, so much more so in something as complex as an impact on. Um, and then I think, you know, we, we do, I think there are a lot of risks that you can anticipate and can mitigate. And I think that's where contextual knowledge is really important, both on the part of the evaluator, but also drawing on all the knowledge of all of your partners. And so one example I can give from the Educate Girls context again, is that, um, you know, fortunately we knew that it was not uncommon for um, schools that were too small or where enrollment was dropping off to be closed suddenly. Mm -hmm. And of course, that presents a real problem for the evaluation. You know, if you have your sample and then all of a sudden, you know, some of those schools disappear, do you track those students at their new school? Do you, you know, just kind of drop them from your sample? That can have real implications for the quality of your measurement. Yeah. Um, and so we were able to mitigate that to a large degree by um, building that into the criteria for the sample we were choosing. We, we only included schools that were above a certain threshold of students. And so when actually a number of schools were um, closed midway through the evaluation, as expected, uh, it affected, I think, four to five schools in our sample, but not dozens or hundreds, which would have, you know, had a really different implication for the reliability of our, our evaluation. So I think those are the kinds of things that you know, sometimes there's things that are truly out of left field, but I think it, a lot of times you can kind of map out a range of possibilities and make sure that everybody's on board with how those might be addressed if they arise. Sure. Well, thanks for that. And I think one other question, uh, you know, that often comes up when one's talking about impact bonds are really the costs evaluated, uh, you know, with the evaluation. Uh, costs associated, sorry, with the evaluation. So um, how do you see that sort of uh, progressing as, you know, you see more and more impact bonds come into the market, uh, especially in a post-COVID world where you will see funding dry up and, you know, a lot of the times one is leaning on uh, donors or outcome funders to actually fund evaluations. So how are you thinking about minimizing costs, maybe leveraging technology, um, you know, to, to keep costs down, but still make the evaluations fairly effective? Yeah, well, I was thinking about this question ahead of time and I was realizing that I have a pre-COVID answer, but I should be updating it to a post-COVID answer because I think that the current conditions have just sent this, you know, area into hyperdrive for ID Insight and for so many other organizations as we're trying to figure this out. Um, I think certainly um, that, you know, there are a lot of ways to mitigate costs that, you know, should always be explored. And I wish there was like a tidy answer to it, but it's this like laundry list of factors that should be considered. I think a big one is, you know, availability of existing sources of data. I think you see that a lot in, you know, high income countries is that often, you know, social impact bonds are done in areas where there's lots of administrative data being collected already. And, you know, you really don't have to go out and do some large scale survey. And um, something like recidivism, where, you know, that's already being tracked through the criminal justice system. Um, so we were able to do that to a degree on the Educate Girls did. We were able to use actually um, their data on uh, out of school girls they had identified and then verified it to make sure that, you know, that was seen as valid by all the partners. Um, I think another big thing is exploiting technology. So we were able again to do that to some degree. We did digital data collection um, where, you know, children's answers to assessments were input, inputted automatically, automatically calculated. That really saves time in terms of data cleaning and ensures I think higher quality. Um, of course, the next step in that is, you know, can you do that remotely? Can you do phone surveys? I, I would say that in learning assessments for little kids, that's going to be really challenging for a long time. Um, but I do think there's a lot of data that we're finding better and better ways of collecting um, in a reliable way, even, you know, kind of at a distance or over phones. And of course, um, that landscape changes really rapidly as mobile phone penetration, you know, increases in different parts of India and around the world. And um, so ID Insight's actually been working for the last couple years on a mobile data collection platform called Data On Demand, 
um, that allows us to do a, a lot of uh, data collection remotely. And then, you know, of course, we're really kind of pushing the boundaries of what that's capable of now that a lot of in-person data collection has been shut down. Mm -hmm. um, the only like final point I would make on costs is I think this is such a valid question because right now, and especially early dibs, have been pretty expensive relative to, you know, just kind of forging ahead with the program. Um, I do think that we need a better kind of cost benefit calculation because I think often there's kind of this sticker shock reaction of like, you spent how much on a dim? <laughs> you know, is that worth it? But I think often what we're seeing is kind of benchmarks against other education programs that we don't necessarily know whether or not they're successful. And I think what we should be thinking about is what is the true value of the outcomes achieved and how much of that is attributable to the DIB, how much of that is attributable to the different parts of the DIB, such as the evaluation. And I would say that I think Educate Girls provides kind of an interesting example um, in that respect because, uh, you know, they were falling behind targets in the first two years. Um, they were still, you know, having a positive impact, but not quite where they had expected to be. Um, they were at about 50% of the targets at the end of the second year. And then at the end of the third year, actually exceeded targets by 60%. So that's this huge gain. I don't think, you know, ID Insight can take credit for that, but I do think that there is some truth to the fact that that DIB structure, I think, really facilitated that, that they had a lot of flexibility to make really bold changes and that they had a lot of data to inform those changes. And so if you did like a really rough back of the envelope calculation and maybe said, well, maybe the DIB, you know, caused that extra like 60%, you know, spike, um, then I think that should change how we think about the cost of that DIB as well and, and whether it was worthwhile. Um, I don't think that's a very robust way of, you know, backing out the value of a DIB, but I would like to see as we do more projects, you know, as all approaching that really thoughtfully and kind of thinking what aspects of those projects are worth it, even if they're sometimes a bit costly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for that, Kate. And, um, you know, I think I want to bring in, um, you know, Akshay and Aditya now. So maybe, um, Akshay, if you can talk a little bit about uh, you know, you run the capacity uh, development center and the accelerator for Nudge. So what are sort of the key levers for capacity building that you focus on? How do you kind of create teams that have, um, you know, culture for data-driven decision-making? And then Aditya, maybe, you know, you can chime in after, um, uh, you know, after Akshay. I think you're one of those few organizations that does have you know a lot of what we're talking about um, uh, you know in terms of systems thinking data systems in place uh, and are using technology for that so would love to hear from both of you maybe Akshay if you want to go first and Aditya after that uh, would love to hear from you as well about how Kevalia built those systems in. Sure so uh, thanks actually for calling it capacity building because while we do give grants and also make connects both funding and ecosystem Capacity is where I think the key value lies in the program. Uh, we do it basically through a comprehensive mentorship by three sets of mentors. So we've got what we call strategic mentors. These are people who built solid scale in either for-profit or non-profit organizations. So, you know, to give you a couple of examples, as Sanjay Prohit, he's speaking uh, in uh, one of the sessions. Um, he's the ex-chairman of Infosys Consulting, or Lan, who is the endowment, chief endowment officer of Azim Premji Foundation. A bunch of people like that who've given us, despite their day jobs, a lot of time. And they spend that time thought partnering with organizations that we choose um, on the accelerator about how to create scale. Uh, which is, you know, again, I know it's a buzzword, but it's one that we care a lot about. So, so in that sense, that's, that's the first set of mentors. Um, the second set is basically the horizontal mentors. Uh, what do early stage nonprofits, which is what we work on, typically need uh, to grow, right? Uh, so there are functions such as HR, marketing, uh, and uh, brand building, and technology, uh, which are very well recognized in the for-profit sector but relatively ignored in the nonprofit sector as you seek to build organizations. So we've got, again, uh, people who are as successful as the strategic mentors in these fields, who've again given us time and work with the organizations on an as-is-need basis uh, to basically help them build out these structures. What it also does, what Horizontal Mentors does, is avoids key man risk. 
you know, it's something we avoid like mad in the for-profit sector, but somehow in the non-profit sector, every capacity builder wants to work only with founders and immediately create schema and risk. So here we wanted to structure it so that these mentors will work with the CXO teams, whoever is leading those pieces of the organization and capacity build them also, hence leaving the founder more time to focus on strategy, more time to focus on scaling the organization, et cetera. Uh, and the third set of mentors is international mentors, where DRK, which is Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, part of Big Bang Philanthropy, uh, they've supported about 150 plus nonprofits globally through funding and capacity building. They sign up with us uh, for three managing directors from their team to work closely with our grantees on both strengthening internal systems and importantly, developing a better understanding of some, how some of the problems that they're addressing have been tackled in other countries, uh, which is a context which is very often ignored in India. Uh, yes, you have to contextualize the solutions for Indian problems, but that said, it gives you a set of building blocks when you look at what's, what else has been tried out globally. So, so those are the three sets of mentors that feed into capacity builder organizations both at the founding team level as well as the second tier level uh, to do that. Uh, the second question of yours in terms of teams that are uh, that have a culture of uh, data-driven decision-making is a tougher one. Um, I'll try to address it slightly because uh, the, the problem is very simple, right? Over, and I'm, I'm, I'm just a couple of years in the nonprofit sector after spending a couple of decades in the stock markets. What surprised me when I came over was that unlike data, which is what drove the for-profit sector, um, here it was all about anecdotes. And I understand storytelling is extremely important. I used it in my days as a research analyst. But, uh, but it is the only thing that's ended up seeming to matter. One of the reasons was very simply that funders don't pay for it, right? Monitoring and evaluation is something you have to claw out of your little overheads that you get. And therefore, it becomes very difficult for an organization to spend a lot of energy, a lot of money on something that is really important. And hence, data becomes something that is ignored over time, uh, even as in growing organizations. So that's one part of it. Um, so what happens is that in the quest for scale, of course, uh, every funder, especially in, uh, you know, in CSR, which is still a developing world, uh, ends up focusing on breadth uh, rather than depth. And there what happens is that in the quest for scale, we forget to ask, should we even be scaling this? Does it matter? Is it causing enough impact? And uh, that's also, in fact, one of the reasons we split the accelerator program over two years, where we take five organizations in the first year and then choose two or three of them for the second year, deciding on, is this really the business model we want to scale? Is this the impact we want to scale? And we triple up our bets in terms of grant sizes in the second year to ensure that it is loaded in favor of the accelerators, money is loaded in favor of impact rather than not. Of course, how we drive the culture, uh, apart from the fact that the second year grants are a lot larger and therefore uh, nonprofits are focused on competing between themselves to ensure that there is impact coming through, is we've got a significant portion as unrestricted and we encourage organizations to use that towards M&E uh, because no one else is gonna pay for it. Uh, we're happy to get them to focus on that and therefore make the programs better. So. Uh, you know, apart from working with them ourselves on the same, we also connect them to thought partners who can help them understand how to collect and how to uh, analyze the data better. Um, a great example is that we're actually having more discussions with the nonprofits and the accelerator about starting labs, um, innovation labs, where they run small changes in the programs, look at the impact, and if there is great impact, scale it across the entire program. So you weave m &E into the decision-making, into the program itself, constantly innovating uh, by actually using the m &E, by using data. And that over time is not just important for funders who are asking for data anyways, 
but also for making sure that there is better impact coming out of your program. And of course, as, as Kate was, you know, you asked Kate about the costs of impact evaluation. As people start spending more money, develop their systems better, the cost for doing the dips themselves in terms of evaluation would start to go down, right? Because they've already been internalized to some extent for these odds. But I'll, I'll hand it over to Aditya because I'm sure uh, there will be a ton of this that he's already done. Yes, yes. Thanks, yeah. Aditya. Would love to hear from you. Yeah. Thanks, Akshay. I was also a banker who moved to the sector just 20 years ago. That's the only difference. And I wondered why on earth we were talking about anecdotes all the time. Uh, I think they're very beautiful, but they're on top of data. So uh, similar sort of thing. Uh, we were actually set up uh, as Kaivalya much before the dip, much more performance oriented. We started in itself saying, what is the highest price performance we can offer for learning outcome improvement in education? It has nothing to do with the dip. And that's just a moral responsibility from which you start. Uh, the total amount of money available in the world is not enough to solve all the problems in the world. The SDGs are underfunded. So if I was to add value, do I add it through an ideology? Do I add it through passion? Do I add it through just, uh, you know, capturing a portion of the market, which one of my colleagues could anyway have done? I don't think any of those are value adding. You have to get the highest price performance that's possible. Uh, that's how companies operate, right? So. Uh, so why shouldn't the sector move like that? And that was 12 years ago when we started off with that. Uh, and for us, therefore, the lever is leadership. So if we don't teach the leaders in schools and the leaders of districts how to look at data and drive performance, you know, in leadership, again, if you ask the question, typically people say, you know, what is leadership? Oh, it's about building team, all this. And, you know, I still remember workshops I did 10 years ago saying all that is true. Leadership is finally about outcomes. Uh, <laughs> build teams for what? For outcomes. Right, uh, manage stakeholders for what? For outcomes, right? Uh, drive vision for what? For outcomes, right? And because ultimately a CEO is measured by PNL, and uh, the sector is not as disciplined as it needs to be, in my view. Uh, so we started with price performance and uh, much earlier, and uh, so we sort of had a three sort of buckets in our journey. The first portion of our journey, despite my driving it, was still not strong enough. We were still showing outcomes, but we weren't able to predict what the outcomes would be. And that's not fun because you know that you're getting it and we weren't able to say, okay, we'll produce a 5% more Delta than last year. Uh, so that's still not good enough. That's a data driven culture, but you're still not able to predict. And so we had over a hundred innovations going up across the thousand schools that we were operating in, but we still don't know which innovation worked better, which worked less. Uh, what was the highest, what we call ROTI, return on time invested, because the key thing is the time of your staff is where cost is. So if you get the highest roti, then automatically you improve. And so we reduced a hundred innovations down to 35, down to uh, 15. And finally, now we make only seven interventions in schools, right? So if you actually want to improve language or math learning, one of those interventions, for example, is a library because children don't have libraries at home. Uh, you only use uh, the textbooks, the textbooks are interesting, but not interesting enough. I need alternate reading and reading comes from practice. So now library, now again, you can just say, okay, does the school have a library? But we've broken that down like crazy. You know, we use the software model of CMM capability maturity models. And we say, okay, where is the library at? Is it at a stage where there's no library, which is level zero? Or is it there is a library, but it's not really being used? Uh, there is a library, it is being used, but it's not graded age appropriate. So it, each child knows what uh, level of book she needs to take or what her level of reading is. It is there, but it's not integrated with schools, with the regular learning process. The class teacher doesn't ask to go in and out of the library process. It is there, the class teacher does it, but the children are not running the library. So each of these is a higher and higher CMM level. Ultimately, you want a library run by children age appropriate, integrated into the school process, including competitions that the teacher is running, which are integrated with stories that the children have just read. That's where you want to reach. But to go through each of these phases, you have to know where your library is in each school today. And you have to know the eight activities that you need to do to get it to the next level. So let's assume there is a library, but the teacher is not integrating it. It's very easy to say you have to integrate it, but there are eight actions that as a leader, you have to take in order to integrate it with the teacher's regular practice. What are the books that she's teaching? What are the, uh, how are they related to what she's teaching in class? Which are the books that are most related? Which are the activities that are most related? 
So we brought all this down to an app that uh, our interveners can take. We call it the journey app because it's a journey to success. And so you first come in, you, you, you measure where your library is, you see what are the milestones that you need to go from CMM level one to level two. For those milestones, you have activities that you need to perform. For those activities, you have resources and all this is available on a tablet. Right. So therefore, a fellow from my organization who walks into a school is suddenly sitting with the entire repository of knowledge from the past. And then there's a back end team, which based on the results is constantly changing what's available in terms of milestones, in terms of processes and resources. And you can connect to anyone else whose library across the. So we work with 6000 schools at the moment. Anyone else who's at the same library process and struggling with the same milestone, you can connect with them and see what they're doing instead. Right. So that sort of network behavior for constantly data and assessment for learning uh, using technology is very critical. It's not just the final assessment. Now, this is just library like this. I have six other processes. What is the teacher's skill in this uh, to be able to do this? What is the parent connect to get the parent invested in the child's reading? But each of these is broken down in a similar sort of way to have a capability maturity model, to have milestones, to then have activities for each milestones and track. So I can today log in and tell you in each of my 6,000 schools where any of these seven processes are, how many milestones have been achieved, how fast they are moving. I can even tell you the number of smileys of my stakeholders because finally when you finish that, the stakeholder puts a smiley or a minus. I can then target my management to make sure that you're going into all the stakeholders who have put minus, all the stakeholders who have not moved milestones fast enough. Uh, I can go and target those particular places and make specific interventions. So even my roti gets even higher. Uh, the more and more I do that. The stakeholder can see what others are performing and you have a benchmark on a weekly basis saying others have moved faster than you. So you gamify this a little bit. So I think you have to embed this entire data culture deeply in the organization if you really, really want to achieve price performance. So now we achieve price performance in you know, the first year of the dip, we were at 570% of the goal. So like you know, three, four times Dalberg came back and checked <laughs> saying, are you sure this is possible? But that's just because the processes yes. exist. And even this year, uh, we'll, we'll at least hopefully be overall in the dip 2x by the end of the four years. I mean, the first year was an overperformance, but we should be 2 to 3x because there's no limit to how much you can achieve if you just keep putting in data systems and technology for this. And Aditya, just building on that, uh, you know, now that the quality education India dip has finished, uh, you know, a year, have there been any learnings, uh, insights for you over the past year? Of course, you, you already came in with a pretty well defined, well built system, uh, you know, which was using tech. But what have been some of your learnings over the last year as well uh, as part of the QEI dip? So actually, two years is over now, uh, Aparna. This is the second year that we've just completed. Uh, so the second year results are going to be released soon. I think, uh, I think the main learning was what I said in the last portion of my statement, that there's just no limit to performance improvement. My team is feeling very proud that we've outdone the results, but unfortunately they didn't get very high scores from me because I still think there are so many processes that have not, uh, that can be improved. So yes, the last mile field worker knows this, but the processes by which the one level above reviews that data, we improved in the second year. We didn't have it in the first year right, through Dalberg, through this thing, we noticed that, okay, the last mile field worker does something, but what is the supervisor reviewing? Her own capability to look at data and provide the right input was weak. And if you go two up, the capability to look at data and patterns over a month and therefore change the interventions, the ability of the design team to look at patterns and change the interventions, all those are not yet strong enough. Uh, so I don't think we've hit the potential that we can as yet. And the DIB is revealing that to us. Um, unfortunately, the standards are not high in the typical CSR sector in India, but I think the DIB is really pushing you to see how high uh, you can go on this. And therefore, and they're very open to us because they're not, see, the normal CSR will come in and will tell you, oh, why did you spend this money on capacity building? Why did you spend on technology? Here, they're just saying, okay, you give me this price performance, then I'll lay off. So now, therefore, I'm able to save some costs and instead invest in more technology and more capability building for my staff, more quality design of the inputs that go at the back end of the tablet, uh, more governance systems, better performance management inside my organization. Uh, so I can invest in whatever it takes to bring performance. And I think that discretion giving to the individual implementer is very important uh, so that we can do it. Otherwise, I have to negotiate saying, no, I want to invest in a tech platform. Why should you invest in a tech platform? You'll get gains only over three years. Uh, is this applicable under CSR law? You know, you get into an unnecessary discussion. Uh, and here, therefore, I love this clear incentivization for outcomes and layoff if 
as long as we're getting outcomes, let us be. Uh, absolutely. Akshay is smiling away. <laughs> yeah, no, he mentioned that um, both of you are touched upon this sort of building, you know, the capacity and building it the way you want to. And in fact, this is something that we touched upon yesterday as part of the masterclass and the investor roundtable as well. The flexibility that it really gives the nonprofits to, you know, to, to spend the money. You're, you know, unlike traditional grants where you're being monitored maybe on a line to line basis. This is, you know, turning everyone's orientation towards outcomes. So, uh, so thanks for, for sharing that. Um, Akshay, I want to actually, you know, bring this uh, back to you a little bit because, um, you know, once talked about capacity building, how that's needed, and yet we see, you know, accelerators, capacity builders sort of uh, being very dispersed and having, you know, smaller programs. So what are your thoughts really on, on scale? Um, you know, how does one take it? Because like I mentioned at the start, you know, investors are showing their inclination to, to fund, um, you know, nonprofits, uh, but they, they say that there isn't just enough a robust pipeline. So how do we build that pipeline? How can we scale uh, capacity building? Sure. Uh, so, so you're right. Uh, the, the challenge is a little bit less funding. Uh, I'm not saying it's not a challenge. Uh, it is. Uh, everything is, as Aditya said, uh, underfunded in the sector. So no matter what you look at, uh, and there are few funders willing to pay for capacity building because they see it, uh, a lot of them cannot understand the value of the structure that is created about around the nonprofit and therefore how it helps the nonprofit in terms of delivering exactly what they want, but it is acceleration that the momentum that it provides. But that said, um, the larger challenge is indeed pipeline, you're right. Uh, it is it is tougher for us to fill up the seats that we've got funding for um, than it is to actually get the funding for those seats. Uh, to, to some extent, I think the problem is that there is, a, there is a little bit of a challenge in upstream terms, in terms of the, um, in terms of the incubators that are working early stage or in terms of angel investors, a role that typically HNIs would have played um, which is not yet really well developed in India. And therefore you're not seeing enough early stage organizations get to the stage we want them to be, to get to the accelerator where we can capacity build them to get ready for serious scale coming through from the CSR perspective. That's, so that's one part. Uh, how you solve that is, you know, seriously a couple of ways, right? Uh, we do run an incubator ourselves at Nudge. Uh, some of those nonprofits have also made it to the accelerator, which is, uh, which is great uh, from an internal validation perspective. Uh, but what I'd love to see is, and there are a bunch of incubators out there, I'd just love to see a lot more. I'd love to see them supported. So as we often tell our uh, nonprofits on, the, on both the incubator and the accelerator, uh, you also want to grow your idea, right? Because organizations have limits, but ideas don't. If it becomes viral, if it gets out there and there are, you know, there are uh, a zillion people working on it, then it is a problem that will get solved, but you yourself might not be able to solve the problem. So what we've done in the past and what we continue to do is that if, as an example, there are any incubators or accelerators who are listening to this session, uh, I would invite them to get in touch. We're happy to open out our program to them, show them how we do what we do, and we'd love for them to develop more people like we end up doing uh, so that there can be a much better pipe that is created of nonprofits that are coming up who think like, as we call them, problem solvers. Uh, one of my... Uh, you know, one of my colleagues is very fond of saying, and I've internalized that, um, that what we are looking for at the nudge is empathy is basically a necessary condition to be in the sector, but it is not a sufficient condition. Aditya also, to some extent, when he was speaking, alluded to that. Uh, we're looking for problem solvers who have empathy. Uh, so to develop that, to create that data-driven culture, we basically need to create a bigger pipeline, and uh, you know, I'd like to rep I'd like to grow the idea, not just our org. Sure. 
Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Akshay. And uh, you know, we just have a few more minutes left today, so I did want to leave some time for uh, you know question and answers. And we've had some good ones coming from the audience. So maybe um, Kate Tushar, if you want to take the first question, this is really about dips. Um, you know, could you have maybe a they are kind of scaling, uh, you know, one social intervention versus a large dip where you are working with tried and tested models? So, what are the pros and cons or the challenges um, as you you know would see in these two models? So, uh, maybe if Kate or Tushar, whoever wants to go first, and then um, would like comments from the other person as well. Uh, Kate, you want to go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> I can take it. I was going to say um, I. I always say that we're not really dib evangelists. Like, I don't think that the future is only or, you know, or mostly dibs. I, I think what's exciting about dibs is this idea of linking um, funding to results. And I think there's lots of instruments for doing that currently. And I think that there's lots of room to improve on that model and kind of explore other models that might do so, you know, more efficiently, especially under certain conditions. So I, I do think that there is a lot of value to thinking about, you know, like what the next step is or, or what are other variations on this model. Um, I think, you know, some of the options outlined here, you know, having larger divs, um, I, I didn't see mentioned outcomes funds, but I think that's a really important kind of possible next phase, you know, of this space is to have, um, you know, outcomes funds develop that can kind of, you know, exploit economies of scale by setting out, you know, a, a broader strategy around measurement and the types of outcomes they want to pay for, rather than having to um, make those investments in one-off projects. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting ideas on the table, and, and I think that it's kind of incumbent on all of us to kind of keep pushing that boundary and figuring out, you know, other and better ways of, of accomplishing these goals. Yeah. Thanks. I, I can quickly chime in, uh, just, just to add some thoughts. I, I completely agree, agree with Kate, I think, on the first point, which is to recognize that dibs have certain prerequisites. And I think it's important to uh, to recognize that, that there's a risk uh, transfer. It's a risk, risk transfer mechanism, which allows for greater funding to flow, and it's very fundamental. And therefore, if, you know, when we think about larger interventions, if they're already proven, then uh, it, it's important to consider whether dibs really work from that scenario, right? Because are we just adding transaction costs, something that, that we already understand quite well? Um, then, and, and if it makes sense, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we're bringing in uh, market discipline uh, into this, as Aditi was saying before, does uh, certainly help. So I would say that uh, that is fairly critical. Um, and I think the second point, uh, uh, which I think needs to be kept in mind, I think that this, the models are still evolving. And I think it's interesting to already see portfolio approaches coming in where outcomes are common or similar. Um, and I think what, what would be really interesting uh, to see going forward as, as, as the market uh, grows is to see just an expansion of the kinds of stakeholders that are coming in. Um, so uh, we, we are seeing, you know, we've seen um, a number of, uh, you know, uh, entities which have, uh, but, but we are more traditional players who have been participating uh, in, in the space. There are a few new ones which have been evangelizing and, and sort of setting it up. But, but are there opportunities, for example, uh, to, to expand the scope, to begin um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to figure out if there are inclusive businesses uh, which potentially um, could, could work uh, through the deep structure? Is there an opportunity to think about the innovation side of it, which I think uh, previously Akshay uh, in, uh, hinted to as well? Uh, and, uh, and, and then are, are there interesting structures which can then be brought about, um, which, uh, which, which help really drive or, or, or where the objectives uh, are, are linked to uh, some of the innovation uh, that can be driven. And then you know, there's, there's need for more thinking around this, but I, I'm sure that if, as, as the objective is to actually increase the pool of capital, thinking about how we can move beyond uh, uh, foundations, we, we, we alluded to uh, HNIs, and then those are, uh, you know, family offices uh, are, are the kinds of investors who have a really strong understanding of commercial dynamics often, and therefore are, is there an opportunity for those individuals to be to be more risk taking and then to participate in the market. Okay. So I think expanding that pool of capital uh, and potentially through an outcomes fund or or, or through pooled mechanisms, uh, as as Kate uh, indicated, uh, could be an interesting path for me. Sure, absolutely. Um, um, Aditya, Akshay, we have another uh, you know question which is targeted. I think. Uh, Towards both of you, is that how does a nonprofit, uh, a new nonprofit, really decide how much fund to allocate between 
you know, building uh, data training and, uh, you know, investing in, in the program itself, uh, given that the opportunity costs for both are, are extreme and, you know, the organization is just starting out. So how do you, um, as a new founder, make these, make these decisions? So maybe Aditya and Akshay, if you want to take this one. You want to go first, Akshay? <laughs> All okay. right, sure. Uh, so it's 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 a bit tricky because it's uh, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of conflicting things pulling on a founder right uh, you've got to get in place your operations you've got to get in place your date uh, you've got to get in place your fundraising you've got to get in place your data that said um, I think that uh, rather than spending a lot of money because at early stages that's not what you need what you actually need is bandwidth, right? If you choose to think about data on a consistent basis, when you structure the program, you structure in feedback loops so that you can actually get that feedback and think about, it doesn't have to be absolute data driven, right? But just the feedback loop can tell you, I've, I've got orgs that are connecting, uh, that are collecting data on uh, Excel sheets and trying to figure out what to do with it. So that's absolutely cool. You don't have to have a multi-million dollar system put in. It's the thought process. So if you can spend 10%, 15% of your time just structuring it correctly, that is what you need right up front. After that, it's about you know running again. Maybe 5-10% of your bandwidth actually goes into that. That itself to me is already something that is going to be very successful because you started off thinking about it, right? And hence, over time, you can start to put more towards that in terms of driving your program. That's, you know, that's a very simplistic answer, but I realized that nonprofits at early stages are more concerned about survival. So you know, I, would, I would love for them to invest 50% of their bandwidth, likely would their survival just go down to zero. So... Yeah. And, but uh, I think you because you've done it yeah. successfully. <laughs> so, uh, so I think we made a lot of mistakes as well in this investment. We didn't invest early enough. If I was to look back at my own uh, case, I don't think we invested early enough. Uh, so Akshay, I largely agree with your experience as well. Uh, we used a lot of Excel files. As soon as we reached about 30,000 children, the Excel files collapsed. Right. So there's a stage at which the system collapses and then you're forced to set up the next system. Uh, so we managed when we had about 300 schools and about 6,000 children, Excel files were working. Uh, then, you know, the system collapses because you need to collect more data, more nuance, uh, more often uh, stuff like that. But I agree with you that it's not about money. Interestingly, we've, we've invested zero in our tech system. Uh, the key thing is the thinking of how you're going to learn what data you want to collect and driving the internal performance culture. That is 80% of the cost really. Uh, I mean, cost as in the emotional cost of driving it. It's not the, the technology itself is a small portion and that, uh, of course, it could be perceived as a large portion, but you don't need to over-engineer that uh, because you need to design it in phases. I think the first stage Excel is enough. Next stage, a simple app is enough. Uh, and increasingly what we do is we, search for apps which solve 70% of what we want to do, which are allow, which are being offered on a SaaS type model, software as a service model. And we just modify and build on top of that app for the time being and we go ahead. Whereas the problem is internal staff will say, nee, I would definitely want that last comma only in that format and that graph only in this format. Now that is going to cost too much money. So the second stage is you do, so I think first stage is Excel, second stage is use existing SaaS Third stage is when you've mastered all this, and this is after three years plus three years, then potentially to invest in your own app uh, makes sense. We were very lucky that Mindtree Consulting uh, invested in our second stage and created that app for us uh, out of their own CSR. So there are ways of getting that money. But the key thing is, I agree with you, Akshay, I think it's more than 15%. I think you're a bit conservative there. If you really want to drive each of these parts, which is think through your data systems, uh, think through the learning loops, think through the performance management culture. Each of those is 10, 15%. And so I think as a CEO, you have to spend a lot of time on this. Thank you, uh, Aditya. Just um, getting reminders from the Nudge team as well. We're actually a little over time, but uh, it's been incredible having all of you as uh, as 
a very insightful discussion. Thank you all for joining and, and all to the participants for their questions and listening in as well.